really happy to see so many of you here this morning. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, that's fine. I've never used one of these devices before, I don't think, so we'll hope that it works. And if you can't hear me in the back, raise your hand and wave, and I'll try to talk louder. I did used to have a study hall voice, but I've kind of lost it over the years, <laughs> Tracy tells me. So I'll try my best to uh, speak clearly, and I'm looking forward to talking to you about things that I've jotted down about my memories of growing up in Clayton and the changes that I've seen here over the years. The title that I chose was Gone But Not Forgotten because one of the main things I'm going to talk about are some of the buildings and landmarks that were here from the beginnings of my childhood and are now gone. And I'm going to uh, more or less divide my talk into a couple of parts. The first part of it is going to is called Growing Up in the Gas Station, because that uh, gas station was an important part of the early years of my life till I was 18 years old. And so I'll begin by speaking just a bit about my ancestors and then growing up in the gas station. My family ties to this northern area of New York State go back more than 200 years, about seven generations. My father is a direct descendant of Henry Hart, who fought in the Revolutionary War. And following the war, Henry left his home in the Hudson River Valley, traveled north, and settled near Watertown, where he is buried in the Arsenal Street Cemetery. In the early 1800s, the family purchased land north of DePauville, established the Hart family homestead there, which the family owned until around 1946, when the farm was sold to the Kirkland family, who are the present owners. My father, however, who was born in 1912, did not grow up on the Hart farm. His parents, Charles and Ada Dixon, had bought a farm of their own on the DiPerno Road. And today, that farm is called the Bonderosa, since my father uh, sold the farm in 1962 or three to Leo and Nancy Bond. But the large house is still there, although the barns burned in 1955. But the house is still there. My father, an only child, graduated from high school, the old Clayton High School, which was located where the present municipal building is, graduated from high school in 1930 at the beginning of the Great Depression. My grandmother had intended that my father would go to college, but times were hard, money was scarce, and my father did not think that they should spend any of their savings to send him to school. I don't think he was ever really a serious student to begin with, who would tell. He spent some time in the Civilian Conservation Corps at a camp in Tupper Lake and worked on the construction of the Thousand Islands Bridge in the late 30s. He was still living on the farm with his parents when he met and married my mother. And when I was born, they were still living on the farm. But times were hard and more income was needed. And so my mother's brother had been operating a small gas station in Clayton <coughs> and my father was offered the opportunity to buy the business on a contract basis, pay it off over time, and that was how my parents ended up living in that gas station for the next 40 years, and I spent the first 18 years of my life there. My earliest memories begin at the gas station, and it was located at 747 James Street. Today that property is a vacant lot, located directly in front of the Gardino Elementary School building and across the street from Kenny Drugs and the Castle Ice Cream Stand. None of that, of course, was there in 1939 and 1940 when my earliest memories began. From the front windows of the gas station, I could see Route 12 in front of me across the street and Far in the distance, I could see tall pine trees, large rocks, and sometimes sparkling water of French Creek. Life in the gas station was sometimes crowded and sometimes uncomfortable. The building had no cellar or firm foundation under it, and the windows, while large and letting in lots of light, were like the doors, all ill-fitting and allowed snow, wind, cold, rain, snow, <laughs> <laughs> really. 
all in all, a cold, drafty living space. An old saying at that time was, Labor Day, Kingston Fair, and bank your house for the winter. <laughs> These are some photos of those early years. Um, yes, if you could start them around, and the whole thing is kind of flimsy, but labels on them, what they are, and you might find them interesting. Later in life, I learned why that gas station had such shoddy construction. It was built by a local businessman during the Great Depression, sometime between 1929 and 1939, possibly with funds derived from bootlegging, which <laughs> thrived here in Clayton, between 1920, when the Volstead Act was passed, and 1933, when the Great National Experiment marked the end of the Prohibition period and the Prohibition law was repealed. By that time, be that as it may, some of the materials used in the construction of the gas station had been salvaged from the demolition of the Manitowoc Hotel. Now, I always had wondered for years what the Manitowoc Hotel looked like. It happened that when Marilyn and Hutch um, ended their photography business, they had a lot of photos for sale. And a large photo on that uh, sheet that's circulating shows a big picture of the Manitowoc Hotel. And you can see how large those windows were. And some of those same windows were used in the construction of the gas station. Um, so it was no wonder that they let in a lot of cold air and draft. Like today. Because <laughs> it's chilly in here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the big windows were totally inappropriate for wintertime dwelling, and the mismatched doors and high ceilings made it almost impossible to heat. My mother always lamented the fact that the school district had not bought the property when they built the new central school, which opened in 1940, since the gas station was lo located really right in their front yard. For me, though, that school being there made a huge difference in my life. The lawns were right in my backyard, and it made a great play area. Wonderful place to fly kites and just run around, play tag, and the brand new cement sidewalks were wide and smooth, and I spent hours uh, roller skating and riding my bicycle up and down and all around the school building. Eventually, they built a well-equipped playground in, in back with swings and slides and a big merry-go-round. And the area was wide open, and all the neighborhood children could play there anytime, and we did. And the hill at the side of the building was just right for sledding and great for learning to ski. And I did all those things there all winter long, every winter. And I'm happy to note that even today, when we have enough snow and there's a buildup, the elementary teachers sometimes still take the children out on their little plastic sleds. We had old metal uh, runners and so forth, but now they have these wonderful plastic shells and so forth, and I see the children sliding over there many days, so it makes me really happy to see that and a fond uh, memory of all the time that I spent there as a child. And the inside of that building was just as wonderful to me as the outside. Only the best materials had been used in the construction of that school. And when I started there at five years old in kindergarten, I really didn't know what I was seeing or what I was looking at. But the, all the halls in that building are terrazzo. The walls, uh, uh, the floors are all terrazzo. The walls in the halls are all ceramic tile. The floors in the classrooms are all solid oak parquet. And the cupboards, all solid oak all the trim in the, in the windows and under the blackboards and so forth, all beautiful oak wood. And I love oak to this day, probably because I saw so much of it there. In my own home, I have a lot of oak furniture and a lot of oak paneling and so forth, and I suppose it all dates back to my seeing all that oak in that school building, but it was truly beautiful. And not too long ago, I had the opportunity to um, go through the building with the class of 66, I think, had invited me back to their annual reunion. 
and they had uh, arranged a tour of the school building. And I was happy to see that much of what was there, the terrazzo, the ceramic tile, the oak trim and all that is still there. A lot of things are gone that were important to me and probably important to a number of you if you went through that school. Kindergarten, we had absolutely beautiful murals that the art teacher at that time, um, Mr. DeStefano, had painted. And I guess so then the people, some people complained. They said that the walls were scary because they had the Pied Piper of Hamlin on them marching the rats out of the city of Hamlin. <laughs> so uh, because of this uh, frightening thing on the wall, they took those, um, put those panels down. Last I knew, they were on a kind of canvas and they had been rolled up and stored in the basement of the school building. But whether they still have survived or not, I don't know. But anyway, the kindergarten and first grade rooms both have those wonderful drawings. And the first grade room also had a stage there. <coughs> that, um, our wonderful teacher, Miss Street, had us um, perform plays there. I remember we did Three Billy Goats Gruff and lots of other good things. She was a wonderful <laughs> teacher, and probably many of you have fond memories of her teaching you to read. I certainly have fond memories of that experience because I was not a very fast learner. At five years old, I hadn't had a lot of experience outside the home, and I was probably stubborn and then, uh, didn't follow directions very well. I didn't know how to tie my shoes. Luckily, the ones that I wore most days were little black patent leather Mary Janes, and I could buckle those, but we had to put on uh, sneakers for gym class, and those we had to keep in a little cubby right there in the classroom. And I could not tie those sneakers. I don't know what my mother was thinking. Maybe they only made high boot sneakers for children in those days. I don't know. But anyhow, that's what I had, and I couldn't ever get them laced up and tied, and the teacher had to tie them every time, much to her frustration. And I think that when she passed me on to Betty Streets in the first grade, they divided us all into reading groups at any rate, and I know that I was in the fourth reading group. And so uh, about halfway through that school year, I, uh, a number of us had what they called scarlet fever in those days. Today, I guess it's a strep infection, but many of us were very ill. And uh, two or three of my classmates, one I know for sure was left with a heart murmur, and it was, it, it was a much more serious illness than in 1943 than it is now. So I was probably out of school for more than a month, and somehow when I was home, I had picture books to look at, and I don't know if they sent flashcards home or not, but anyway, when I came back to school, Miss Street showed me the flashcards for the fourth reading group, and then the third, and the second, and then the first, <laughs> and she said, wow, Shirley Dixon knows the flashcards for all the reading group. We'll have to move her up. And after that, I could read everything and did it all, all the time and really for the rest of my life, became an avid reader, loved it. It was a uh, happy result for me. Anyway, um, oh dear, let's see. Uh, yeah, I already described what a wonderful building it was. I had a, Yes. I was up there just a while ago in recent years, and I noticed how the hallways were much smaller when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> I think that They're happens smaller. as we age. <laughs> 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 yeah, the place looks huge. I was scared to death, really, even though I had played in the yard of that school and had looked at it all my life, as far as I knew, when I actually had to enter kindergarten there. And my mother brought me up, and she brought me to the front door of the place. But in those days, you know, they didn't molly cow it, cow it kids very much. They just let kids off, and they walked to the classroom on their own. And so uh, I think there was a janitor standing there, and he said, go all the way to the end of the hall or something. And it seemed to me like that hall was a mile long, and as you say, very wide and very huge and very frightening. So I, I think it's a good thing that parents are more involved today in getting their children started at school. I had a I to talk about that. Well, I, I make a few comments about education here. I said 
I had intended in this talk to focus on buildings that I grew up with that no longer are here, but I had to include the school because it's always been an important part of my life. I entered kindergarten there in the fall of 43 when I was just five years old and graduated in 1955 at age 17. I think that everyone who went through that school at that time received a truly superior education if they wanted to. Many students failed grades in those days, and many dropped out in eighth grade. I don't think anyone was much concerned about our self-esteem in those days. The focus was on reading, writing, and arithmetic. And during the course of my 32-year teaching career, I watched schools try to become all things for all students. This is probably impossible, but we keep trying, and we still succeed with many and fail miserably with others. I'm hoping that maybe the computer age can change all this. We shall see. Anyhow, I left for college at Hobart and William Smith in Geneva, New York in September of 1955. My trunk was shipped from the train depot here in Clayton. And I think that may have been the first time I was ever in that building, that depot. I, I uh, was in it a few times after that. I think those train depots are just wonderful buildings. And I'm glad to see that uh, some of them still exist, even here in the North Country. There's one that I go by frequently in Brownville. It's a very small depot, and I think, wow, what a great building that is. So it's one of my regrets that, the, uh, that we lost the depot. But we do have the beautiful Frank Park, and I guess that maybe is a good exchange, hope so. <laughs> um, another building that I continue to miss is the Hubbard Hotel, which was located where the Bertrand Motel is located today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. These could both go, I guess. This is the Hubbard Hotel and some other scenes of buildings that I now on. And these are pictures of the school and also um, Steve. So I, I was, uh, and yes, uh, Bertrand Motel is located there today. That hotel had a fine dining room, great food for. Um, eat in or send out for picnic lunch. And um, the senior banquet when I graduated from high school was held there at the Hubbard. I also attended several retirement parties for the older teachers in the Clayton Central School System. Robert Charles, who had been the principal for almost the whole time I attended school there. And also Gwen Larry, who had been my high school English teacher. They both had really wonderful retirement dinners at the Hubbard Hotel. And um, years after that, no, well, not many years, maybe five or six years after high school, um, Rip and I were renting a house on Huberton Street. It was half of the house. It's now the Gardino House. And so in the summer evenings, we would walk downtown to see what was going on. And we often stopped at the Hubbard because they had the tiniest little bar on the very end of that building that was closest to the Lost Navigator. And that tiny little bar had a couple of little booths in there. And Harold Bertrand was the bartender. And he mixed absolutely the best whiskey sours I've ever had in my life. I haven't sampled them yet at the, at the new hotel, but it's on my bucket list. And one of these days we'll get over there for it. Um, of course, I shall always remember McCormick's restaurant. There's a picture of that on one of the uh, sheets that is circulating, which was located on land next to where Bella's is today and where the new condominiums have been located. I worked there as a bus girl, a waitress, and sometimes a hostess during my high school and college years. Vince D., the owner, provided employment for generations of students and help to make their college educations possible. I don't know how many young people today, well, old, old people they are now, but it went on for generations since hiring college kids in the summertime and 
so many of them will say to me how grateful and thankful they were to have had a chance to work their summers, earn decent money, and pay for their tuition. It was while I was working there on a warm summer evening in 1956 or 1957, I watched the destruction of Calumet Castle. It began with what looked to be a small brush fire on private, uh, on the upside of the island, but it soon became apparent that the inside of the castle was also ablaze, and the, the fire department made efforts to quell the blaze, but the interior of the castle was destroyed and eventually, within a short period of time, the entire building was raised. I had been inside the castle several times during my childhood and teenage years, and while it was not as large or grand as Bold Castle, I thought it was more beautiful, and some of the rooms had beautiful stone fireplaces with great views of the river, and there was a wonderful ballroom trimmed in beautiful wood with an orchestra pit. I had a childhood dream of earning a lot of money and returning to Clayton and restoring that castle to its former glory. I realized when it was torn down that this was the end of that. No one would ever, could ever afford to build anything like that today. And I'm glad that the Bridge Authority eventually became the owners of Bolt Castle and they continue to work on the restoration of that castle. But it really is a shame that our village lost Calumet because now it would be just a, a huge attraction and it was, it was a great loss to the community. Uh, Shirley, wasn't that a rumored as a tax fire? I'm sorry? Wasn't that rumored as a tax fire? Well, <laughs> yes, it may have been. I, <laughs> I can't say. A group of local businessmen owned the castle at the time and it wasn't profitable and there very well may have been some help in getting the fire started. I don't know that. I didn't see it. But all I saw was a burning. <laughs> yes, there were rumors of that kind, however. Another important building that disappeared in my lifetime was the Frank Snowplow Complex. This factory provided employment for many local people as well as for many folks from the surrounding area and who needed uh, winter income, including my father, who um, worked there for uh, 33 years. The plant was located at the terminus of the New York Central Railroad and was also right on the river. Snowplows made at Frinks were shipped all over the world, and since the plant would never close, we thought. But times change, properties change hands, loyalty shift, and the plant not only closed, but stood vacant for for many years on valuable property that nobody would invest in because the expense of removing toxic pollution and uncertain development costs and, and other unknowns. Finally, our village obtained grants, found buyers, and after much hard work, discussion, and compromise, we now enjoy a beautiful hotel on that property, and everyone in the village is proud of it. I think that it would have been a good thing if, if earlier on maybe Franks had decided to relocate out on East Line Road. There was all this talk of that happening and it would have been a good thing, but it never did happen. And so finally the uh, plant just closed and sat there. But now we can be proud of the hotel that's there. Shirley? Yes. Can I add a, add a comment? You were sure. talking about Frank Snowplow being shipped all over the world. Yes. A lot of people are not aware that Frank Snowplow sent a plow to Hawaii. For the the high, to Hawaii. For the highest uh, mountain on one of the islands is a Frank Snowplow. Really? <laughs> That's right. I, do know they, I do know they go everywhere. Uh, this is a picture of my father's retirement from Freaks in 1976 after 33 years of employment there. And I don't have any little snowplow, but you know, they, there is one I think in Frank Park now that people, maybe I, oh yes, here it is. Um, the men, you know, had some, it was hard work in that plant and it wasn't, uh, it wasn't always ideal conditions. A lot of smoke there and, uh, paint fumes and all kinds of unhealthy things that probably wouldn't be allowed today in a plant. 
And on, the, on their off times and I suppose odd hours when they weren't really busy, those men made things. One thing that they made that my father brought home and that I still have in my kitchen drawer is this bottle opener. It's copper and it has his initial on it and it's kind of an unusual item and a product of Frank's that was not a snow plum. And this little ashtray uh, was also, I people said that they made them there. I don't know, it looks like a lot of work and I'm not sure that it's handicraft, but anyway, it's an interesting ashtray. You put your cigarette up here and then or stick it in there, and it was around in our household for a long time. My brother wanted them both, but I kept Now, in the, in the first part of this presentation, I have tried to focus on buildings that were once here in Clayton, but are now gone, and only live on in memories and photographs. In the second part, I'll discuss my own neighborhood, which is at 726 Grave Street, and how it has changed over the years. Our house was built around 1920, and it's a good example of what is commonly known as American Foursquare. What was that last word that you said? American four square. S Q A R E. The uh, these homes are identified by their wide porch, boxy shape, hip roof, and often a crowning dormer, which our house does not have. Uh, this style of American architecture was featured in this <coughs> January month's issue of Country Living, and so. Of course, I found it extremely interesting. I thought you might too, so I skipped, I put the article out and it'll be coming around. We bought the house in May of 1961. And aside from painting it all one color, a kind of pinkish tan, we made few changes in the exterior until 2002 when we added an addition in the rear of the structure which included a large bedroom, bath, family room, and pantry. This was built for my mother, and she was 87 years old at the time, and she occupied it for more than 10 years. Now, I have to say, Griff and I are most grateful uh, that, and thankful that we did that, because we now live in that part of the house, and we almost never go upstairs. And so it, uh, it was a, really a good thing. My mother enjoyed it, and now we're enjoying it. At the time we bought the house, Grave Street, for all intents and purposes, was a dead-end street, ending in what everyone in our family called the Bumpy Road, which begins about where the school property began and ended at East Line Road. The east side of the road, which ran along the railroad tracks, was a completely vacant field with uneven terrain and several swampy pond areas filled with all matter of birds, wildlife, and delicious wild strawberries in the spring and early summer. Anyone who drove past our house, or worse still, began walking onto the bumpy road, was obviously lost, or probably up to no good. <laughs> our, our German Shepherd Juno seemed to know this, and she managed to get in a few bites during those early years. And aside from the uh, fox house and a vacant cottage next to it, which was seldom used, the only other building was a uh, craft cheese plant. I'll talk about that in a minute. I'll talk about um, how that Grave Street property was divided up. It was called Grave Street because the whole tract from where Grave Street is all the way over to James, maybe all the way over to French Creek, I'm not sure, was owned by a man named Graves. And I think at one point it was some kind of a toll street or something. He charged the fee for anybody to go up through there. That would have been, I guess, in the 1900s, I'm not sure. Sue Grant told me that, and she was Sue Graves. So someone in her family had told her that. So I expect it was probably true. Anyway, if you go by that house today, it's on the left-hand side going out Grave Street. It has cement steps in front, and 
um, engraved into the cement of the steps, it says Peter B. Graves. And as I say, he owned all that land. He had quite a large family. I'm not sure about what sons he had, but I know he had three daughters. He had Jesse, Inez, and Mimi Graves. Jesse Graves married a man named Diefendorf, and they built the house immediately next to ours. It too is a four square, it's brick. And Excuse me, it's a brick house, and apparently they didn't live there very long. I never really knew the Diefendorfs to live there. They lived on a farm, lived on a farm on Route 180 between Guns Corners and Limerick. But that house was always a rental. It was a, and it was still a rental when we bought our house in 1961. So that was the one daughter, Jessie Diefendorf, and the house immediately next to us. What was her home, well, it was supposed to be her home, and she owned the property. Then came the house that we bought and presently live in. That was um, owned by the Tiffany's, Frank and Inez. Frank built the home, and he uh, worked with wood and lumber, kind of carpenter, worked at Brooks Lumber Company. And so there was a lot of nice woodwork through our house. My kitchen cupboards are still the original ones. I didn't really like them when I first moved there in 1961, but we couldn't afford to do much about it then, so I lived with them, and the longer I lived with them, and the longer I saw how new homes were built, those cupboards are solid wood, the doors are solid wood, the catches still work as perfectly now as they did in 1920 when the house was built, and I ended up keeping that kitchen, and I recently had some of the woodwork in there refinished. So Frank Tiffany uh, did a lot of different things around that house. They, it was a uh, rooming house at one time, and we bought it in 1961. It still had a big lighted sign that came out from the side of the house. And then in the summertime, they rented all four bedrooms upstairs, and uh, um, the bathroom was upstairs. There was no downstairs bath then. And they uh, had toilet and uh, sink facilities in the cellar of the house, and the bed was in the attic of the garage. And they would rent all four of those rooms all summer long. Lots of times the tourists who were coming to the local peeler here in Clayton down on John Street. And even, af even after we had lived there for a few years, every once in a while someone would come and knock on the door and ask if we still rented rooms. And, they, and then not only did the Tiffany's rent rooms all summer long, well, they also rented them during the school year. And I found out after we bought the house that my seventh grade social studies teacher, Jerry Black, had lived in the bedroom that I used as a nursery for my daughter, Tori. So uh, they rented those rooms to teachers as well. And a lot of you might know or might have known Jerry and Vivian Black. And Vivian, interestingly enough, rented a room in the house right across the street that was still owned by the Peter B. Graves, the original house. So she was right across the street from Jerry, so I suppose it was no, and they taught the same school, so it was no wonder she was Vivian Farley when she came here, but it wasn't long before she became Vivian Black. And she was about my favorite teacher, I guess, in high school. She and Gwen O'Leary, both English teachers, and I became an English teacher, so I have to say, they were probably my mentors. But to get back to the property, which was what really prompted me to begin to talk about it, because we had the Diefendorf owning the house next door, us owning the house that Inez and Frank Tiffany had owned, and then there was a big vacant lot, which went from our driveway all the way down to the next house down, like a double lot, really. And that belonged to the other sister, Mamie Graves, who never married, and Mamie lived there in our house with the Tiffany's. And when Mamie died, that she didn't have any children, she never married, no heirs, and didn't she leave that lot to the Rebecca Lodge? Well, the Rebecca Lodge was the female part of the Oddfellows Lodge, and those ladies decided they needed to have a meeting room. And so they proceeded to try to raise funds and build the building, which they did. And eventually, though, there were only two or three of them left. And they ended up joining with the Rebecca Lodge in Redwood, New York. And the building sat there. 
uh, not really being used. And so my husband looked into buying it, and finally he was able to. And so we owned that building, which we really didn't want, but we also didn't want just anything to go on there. So we ended up building that, owning that building, and we still own it. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure what we'll do with it. It's not in very good shape. It too didn't have great construction, and so we may end up maybe raising it, and, uh, just you know, bulldozing it into the earth. I've seen how easily that can be done. I watched the house over on Alexandria Street this past spring, just be in, in a weekend. It was there on Friday and gone on Monday. So it may be a simple procedure for us to get rid of that Rebecca Lodge building. We'll see. So anyway, I thought that was kind of an um, interesting way that the property changes hands and the way things go. Um, I, other buildings on our street were few and far between. The only other building, there were, when, when we bought the house, the only other building in the area was the Kraft Cheese Plant. It stood right on the corner of State Street and Grave Street. And it, uh, was built in the, I, well, I'm not sure, probably around 1950, because I can remember as a kid in the schoolyard going over there with paper cup, and they would give kids cups full of cheese curds and so forth, and so I know it was there when I was still uh, pretty much a child, and it was still there running as a craft cheese plant when we bought the house in 1961. And and one time when I was ill with a cold, and Dr. Folks, who was the local practitioner, he made house calls and he came to, I guess, give me medicine or whatever for my cold. And he happened to notice that there was a storage tower in the back of that craft cheese plant and it didn't have any cover on it. It had an open top and I guess whey and white foam would form on the top of that tank and then it would blow out into the driveway. Now, German Shepherd, June loved it. She was always going over there and eating at home. But Dr. Folks said that it was a health hazard and that they shouldn't be allowed to uh, have that tank with no top. And so he looked into it, and within a short period of time, they did put a top over it. I'm not sure that anyone ever would have gotten sick from the white foam blowing around, but maybe. Never bothered June on one. <laughs> um, so eventually, in the 1960s, the companies began to merge, and smaller plants like the one that the craft the company was running there in Clayton, I guess weren't profitable, and anyway, they shut down the plant, and finally, it stood vacant for a while, and then a man named Bill Ryan bought it. And Bill owned property downtown, um, well, it's hard thing to say. It's all where the local, almost across the street from here, where the restaurants are now. There was a brick building there, and in it, he had uh, installed um, freezers. They called it a locker plant, and people would uh, buy a side of beef and take it and freeze it in the locker plant and have their meat for the winter, and it was particularly popular with hunters. They would kill a deer and take their deer carcass down there, and Bill Ryan would cut it up, and they'd store it in the freezer. Well, anyway, he bought that craft building, and he proceeded to open a locker plant there. And that was a, wasn't a bad business to have across the street from you. It wasn't very busy and quiet, and no, no pollution involved with it. So that, that was OK, and that went on for quite a little while. But then people, I guess, began to probably buy larger home freezers. Who knows? Anyway. Locker plants kind of went out of style, and Bill Ryan put the building up for sale and didn't sell right away. But finally, a man in Canada bought it, and he started producing fiberglass boats there. By that time, Harold and I were spending our summers at our cottage on Butterfield Lake, so we weren't there, you know, from about May until well, after Labor Day, and. And when we came home one fall, after they opened this fiberglass boat plant, there was a strong odor of plastic fiberglass just wafting through the air in the neighborhood. And I was really concerned about it and complained to anyone that would listen, but nobody listened. <laughs> but eventually, the business, I guess, failed and the building was 
empty again and stood empty for a good long time until finally, within the last 10 or 15 years, Community Bank bought it and they have built a beautiful bank there with nice landscaping and I'm really pleased with that. You know, I would say to them, welcome to the neighborhood. Nice to have you here. <laughs> As for the remainder of the east side of the road, which had been totally wild and undeveloped, I'm sad to report, and as you already know, it did not remain wild and undeveloped for very long. A local developer bought it in the mid-1960s and immediately convinced our village board that uh, <coughs> changed the zoning to uh, industrial development. And so he built a new building there to house the Clay Manufacturing Company, which was owned by George Hahn and was locally called the Knitting Mill. And it was housed in a dangerous old fire trap building, I would say, on Mary Street, two or three stories high and all wood, and lots of women worked up there on sewing machines and made bathing suits and so forth. So this new building was certainly an improvement over where they had been. Um, I fought tooth and nail to no avail. <laughs> and my friend said, oh well, it'll be all right, Shirley. Now we'll call your street Factory Street. And I said, oh, <laughs> thanks a lot. Um, and the, actually the development really has not been that bad because the Clayton Manufacturing Company, while they never did plant the beautiful trees and do the landscaping that they'd shown in their drawings when they were presenting it to the village board and to the few, few residents who lived there on Gray Street who were concerned about it, uh, that never really happened. But um, it just eventually evolved into, uh, after the knitting mill closed, they uh, began to manufacture tents there, and that was kind of a convenience, you know, tent factory. I think I probably even bought a tent or two. And then after the tent factory closed, finally Fourth Coast owns it now, and they, uh, you know, make solar panels, and uh, not, it has certainly increased the traffic on our street, but certainly isn't a bad thing to have either. And then beyond that, we have uh, um, the dental office, and that's an attractive building with lots of nice trees around it. And beyond that, we have the fire department in tears. And so for two people, you know, 80 years old, they certainly aren't bad things to have for me. <laughs> <laughs> We've been, uh, they've been helpful to us on more than one occasion, and so. Within the course of my lifetime here, of nearly 85 years, there have been some truly remarkable changes in our little village. I especially appreciate our downtown area, which now has the buried wires and the river walk and is more beautiful than I've ever seen it. And I, this, this I think is thanks to our mayor and to the forward thinking members of our village board and other, commi other committees that have worked long and hard to try to accomplish um, the bearing of the wire, wires and also the river walk. I, nothing has made me happier than that. I, as a child, I had always heard that Charles Emery, who had built Calumet Castle, really wanted to have the village facing the water so that when he looked out of his castle, he could look over and see uh, a nice village street. Well, that never happened, and I don't know why it didn't happen, but at the time that they first uh, began to talk about Riverwalk, I did write a letter to the Clayton Local Development Committee and made the point that that had been planned many years ago, and it really would have been a good thing had they done it then, that I hoped that they would move forward with it this time. And I, I received it and I said I would do anything that I ever could to help. And I guess at one point it was one business person who was holding back or in some way causing a problem with the development of the river walk. And I did get a letter from Bud Barrow who headed up the committee at the time and said, you know, if you could do anything about this, it would be helpful. But eventually the whole thing was ironed out and we do have our 
river walk, something that of which and the buried wire, something of which we can be justly proud. And as far as the wires are concerned, in 1963 or four, right after we bought that house on Grave Street, a friend from college was visiting and he parked his car on the street at night and O'Brien's was going full blast in those days and people would sometimes come roaring up through there even though the end of the street wasn't paved and someone about 1.32 o'clock in the morning came up through there and ran into the back of our friend's car and jammed it into the utility pole that was right at the edge of our driveway. That toppled the pole into our side yard, the transformer flew off, we had blue flames and smoke and fire and just a terrible mess there. And the next day, the Niagara Mohawk people were there making the repairs, and I went out and I spoke to them and I said, you know, I wonder if there's any chance that we ever could have buried wires on our street here. And he looked at me and he said, lady, you'll never live to see it. <laughs> I'm really thrilled that uh, I, maybe I haven't seen it on Grave Street, but at least I've seen it downtown in our community, and if it's there, possibly someday it can be everywhere, you can't tell. Um, I, I have seen all of the changes that I've spoken about, and at present, it seems to me we're on the verge of a, a, maybe a major shift that bothers me, um, in that we seem to be moving from a closely knit community quite homogeneous in nature, where you know everyone with, um, where, you, where you know everyone and, and you can, uh, we could know who lived in every house. Can I butt in for a minute? I want to say that we have a lot of people who only claim for only two years and then they're out of the village and we never get to know them. And yeah. That's the way it's getting to be. I agree with you 100%. Yeah. That well, we're getting to be Airbnb. It seems to be <laughs> on the verge of a change from this kind of homogeneous uh, community to one that's kind of a largely a second home, maybe classy resort area with fewer young families and more retired people, and you hardly know anyone. I do know that when I was 10 years old, I could ride my bicycle up and down the streets and all around the village, and I could name everyone who lived in every single house. Today I'd be lucky to be able to name 25, and I would guess that of those 25, if I were to go up and knock on the door, and someone would answer, and would they say, why, hello, Shirley, good to see you, come in? I don't think so. I suspect some of this disconnection and narrowing of acquaintances is due to my age, and um, certainly for the... Uh, and certainly due to this dreadful pan pandemic that we've all had to face and experience. But I definitely sense a change, a big change, from what I experienced. So perhaps it will be for the best. Who knows? I don't know. So I thank you for your attention. Yes. Surely you must remember the trains coming in out of Clayton since you're on that side of town. Oh, yes. Uh, and another thing I'd like to ask is, in the gas station, you must have had quite a bit of entertainment by things that happened in the gas station. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody's car blow up at the gas station or important people come through that you recognize someone, politician or? Well, that I know that a, a, a lot of wealthy people stopped to buy, that, buy gas there, even though it was kind of a junky gas station because um, some of those larger eight-cylinder vehicles required white gas, and my father, for a good many years, sold Amoco, and that was a clear white gas. It was more expensive than most gas, and so I got to see a lot of Buicks and Cadillacs and nice big cars. They were always disappointed that it wasn't a you know, full service station with all the bells and whistles that most service stations had in the 50s. It was more like the kind of service station you drive in today. In fact, a lot of people did sometimes pump their own gas and just come in and give my father and mo mother the money. So that, that kind of thing is what goes on today mostly at what they call a service station that no longer is. But through the 40s, 50s, and 60s, 
we really had wonderful service stations, which I understand is, is the rule today in Japan. There you pull in and they clean your windshield, they you know, wear up your tires, do everything without even asking. So sometimes change is good and maybe sometimes not so good. <laughs> Yes, you'll have to speak up because I do wear hearing aids and sure, I don't hear very well. talking about uh, Grave Street uh, and all up the left-hand side of Grave Street going up East Line Road. When I was a kid, that was owned by the Catholic Church and it was a pasture for Youngstar. That's right. And uh, they owned the two farms over on uh, Hayes Road. That's right. And uh, that young stock came from those farms over there to that summer pasture mm -hmm. on Grave Street. Yep. Yeah. I used to chase baseball since high school <laughs> played baseball. They did a foul ball and they go over in that field. Sure. Yeah, and if you found it and Kelly Allen knew you found it, you had to get it back to her. <laughs> <laughs> so you just go find the ball and not pick it up. Just leave it there. Then when the game's over, go back and pick it up. <laughs> and you're also talking about uh, freaks. Yes. Uh, I have at home uh, a set of steel um, oh, See, uh, sawhorses. Oh, sawhorses, yeah. That were made in France by my father in law. Then, uh, probably every fishing guide between here and Hockersburg has a French deep frying pan. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, they probably made more frying pans at France than they made snowballs. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Yes. Uh, sure, like, so uh, earlier in your presentation, you were talking about the, the elementary school, Gardino school, and my mom is of the line, so her grandfather's brother built that school, his company, so when you were talking about the quality, uh, I was proud to hear it because knowing that one of my ancestors helped build that school, or his company built it, and I remember my mom always beaming, you know, all of us were clear kids, a lot of us, eight of us, mm -hmm. you know, go to the school, enjoy it, your ancestors yeah. built it. Yeah, well, it, it, was, it is, was, and still is, I think, beautiful building, I never been at another school around anywhere that is any nicer or that has that quality of material. I've never seen another one with marble bathrooms. They built Alexander Bay School also. Alexandria Bay School. Yes. The line construction. Yeah. Yes, the line. Cape Vincent School. So they, they built uh, about 25 schools in the North Country. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, well, a lot of it, I imagine, was public money because it was the end of the Depression right. and they were trying to get people back yeah. to work. So the public they, works. Uh, yes. Yeah. One last question, Shirley. How'd you meet that grip guy? I'm sorry? How did you meet that grip guy? How'd you meet Dad? <laughs> Kenny's asking, how did you meet Dad? How'd you meet Rip? How did I meet Dad? Yeah. Well, he, he, uh, Neighborhood kid? Yes, we grew up together, really. We started dating when we were 16 years old, and, um, that one picture showing us, uh, skiing in wintertime out at Manitowoc, that's, uh, Rip and uh, two of his friends, George Levery and Dick Basnett, were along that day. Another kid that was out there skiing was a, quite a bit younger was um, Erlen, the Erlen boy that married uh, Terry Ingerson and was later killed. That he is in some other photographs that I had that day when we were out there skiing. It was a lot of fun, but yes, we started dating when we were 16 and when I was about, uh, let's see, I guess it was either my freshman or sophomore year in college, Harold had joined the Naval Reserve in high school along with uh, George Levery and some other boys in Clayton, and uh, they went for the two years active duty. So about the time I was finishing college, Harold was finishing the Navy. Harold's father had a small construction business here in Clayton, and so we moved back here, and he worked with his dad for a while, and I began teaching school. And then after a while, both Harold and his dad went to work at Wingrass. And that's how I ended up calling him Harold more of the time than Rip. 
I, I feel now that at the end of our lives, I'd like to call him Rip again. So <laughs> I, only people who knew us when we were, you know, young and in high school really know that name. But it was his father's name, and I think he enjoyed uh, our using it, so I started to use it again sometimes. But when he worked at Wingrass, they couldn't have two rips on the job. And that Rip was his father's nickname first because he'd been a baseball player for a town team in the 30s and he was always stretching to catch and get the ball and would rip out the back of his pants. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I can just add that because of that conflict of them both having the same nickname, when I was a child, they used to call my grandfather Old Brick. <laughs> Is there a purple folder in there? Well, I, don't know, yep. I don't know whether you appreciated that very much or not, but that is what happened. <laughs> were you in the same grade together or in school? In were school, we in the same, the same grade? grade? No. no, Harold is two years older than me, actually, and um, he graduated ahead of me. And so, no, we weren't together in school very much, actually. He, he had a terrible time with English, though, and so he was once in my English class, and, and Gwen O'Leary said to me, you know, you better help that boy with his English. And so I, I'm still doing that. Uh, I, uh, Shirley, yes. back to the school. Yes. I went to school at, up here all my years, and I've gone to the high school for different and I can't help but compare them. How much better this school is than this high school that was built later on, the construction of that. Yes. How that you walk in this school up here and the floor is just gleam. You know? Yeah, it, I don't know, it gives you a good feeling. Although I have to say, I have talked to people who, you know, they were kids who didn't like school and hated to go through the door of the place and they can't imagine my. Uh, Having such positive feelings about it. Did uh, you later teach in the school? Yes, yes, that was kind of interesting, Joe. I uh, began teaching there in 1959 and taught there for uh, 30, 32 years when I retired in 1992. And um, the principal who hired me, his name was Robert Charles, and he had come to Clayton as the principal of that school in, uh, when I was in uh, second grade, and his son, Richard Dick Charles, went all through school with me. So when I interviewed for the job, it was kind of like, it wasn't a big deal. Uh, I, I enjoyed my years teaching there. When I retired in 1992, I'd always planned to retire when I was 55, and that year the New York State offered a big incentive for teachers to retire, and actually when I um, compared what my retirement pay would be and what it would be if I remained teaching, I would be making more money to retire, so I said it's time to go, and I never regretted it, although there are things about it that I miss. I still, when I'm reading newspaper or magazine, I think, oh, that would tie in nicely with uh, Tale of Two Cities, or that would tie in nicely with Moby Dick. And then I think, you fool, not only would it tie in, not, not tie in, they don't even teach those classics anymore in most of the schools. So I, I don't know. I don't, I don't think I could probably teach these days. <laughs> Oh, I, I could certainly teach them grammar, but nobody teaches, nobody cares about that anymore either. They're spelling either. They have a computer that, you know, does a spell check, so we don't need to spell. And who cursed writing anymore? Or writing, that's right. Remember going the circles of yes. the in fourth grade. Yes, that's old as in fourth grade with Bethel Do you remember the pistol rage nose on? Yes. Yeah. Think of that having that today. <laughs> Probably there are people who would like to have it. <laughs> certainly, and Osborne Steele certainly did a you know, great job. We should have talked about his gun shop. That's an interesting place to go. Okay, any last questions uh, for Shirley? All right, uh, Shirley, uh, I want to thank
thank you very much. You're actually making history today <laughs> because you're the first speaker for the sesquicentennial event. Okay. So nobody can ever take that away from you. You will always be the first speaker, the first event for our celebratory year. And, and I have a certificate here, just a token appreciation uh, given you, presented, uh, an appreciation for participating in the Hagenau Ranch Week but sharing your story. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to leave by giving it.